Hello, my name is Daniel and this is a dubbing of Andres Cervantes from Architecture. The scale morphology of absolutely all the elements that will appear in the video were altered to simplify the representation and interpretation. Today, I bring you one of the greatest engineering marvels, the Panama Canal. First, let's provide some context before the construction of the canal. Ships had to navigate around South America to cross from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific and vice versa. We start this story in Colombia in the year 1882, more precisely in the Department of Panama, which was at the time part of Colombian territory. Since colonial times, there had been an intention to create an inter-oceanic crossing here. In that year, the Frenchman Ferdinand de Lesseps, known for the Suez Canal in Egypt, initiated the construction of the Panama Canal. The first obstacle was the Culebra Cut. Remember that to create a continuous canal, both oceans and the canal itself must be at the same level, so all this terrain had to be removed to reach sea level. It was not an easy task. Rain, landslides and tropical diseases hindered progress until, due to various technical and political reasons, the project was suspended. I won't delve into the history, but the situation was complex in general. The United States and Colombia entered into a treaty for the construction and administration of the canal, but the Colombian Senate did not accept it, leading to the separation of Panama in 1903. This allowed the United States to negotiate directly with the Panamanians. It was agreed that the United States would build and administer the canal indefinitely, paying an annual rent to Panama. Let's take a look at the entrances to the canal. On the Atlantic end, we have Colón, the most important city on the Panamanian Caribbean coast. On the Pacific side, we have Panama City, the capital of this new country. Since Ferdinand de Lesseps' direct canal was very complicated for the reasons we've seen, it was considered better to create an artificial lake 27 meters above sea level. Ships would only need to be raised from one ocean to the lake and then lowered to the other ocean. I'll show you more about this later. Let's see how the lake was made. To create a lake, you need water. A lot of water. Fortunately, the Chagres River was right there. All that was needed was a dam large enough to create a lake deep enough for ships to pass through. So, in 1907, the Gatun Dam was built, which managed to flood the region, leaving several towns beneath the lake, but not before relocating the residents and the local fauna to other parts of the country. On the southern end is Panama City, and access is from here. We can see the first obstacle, the ascent from here to there. For this, there are several locks. Locks are chambers with gates that regulate the water level inside. On the Pacific side, the Miraflores locks were constructed, consisting of two double locks, allowing for two-way flow or double flow in one direction, depending on the needs of the moment. But there was a problem. The process of ascending involved an exchange of water between the ocean and the lake. Therefore, just two locks would be insufficient for the transition, as they would bring too much seawater into the lake, making the lake water unsuitable for human consumption. So additional locks were added, called the Pedro Miguel locks. Instead of directly connecting to the Miraflores locks through a canal, another artificial lake was created in between, known as Lake Miraflores. The Pedro Miguel locks are connected to Gatun Lake by a canal through the cut that had been made in the Culebra Cut, which is also known as the Guilard Cut, in honor of an American engineer who worked on the project. Now, let's head to the Atlantic side. Here, the Gatun locks were constructed, consisting of three double locks that directly communicate with Gatun Lake. But how are these structures supposed to raise and lower massive ships to the level of the lake? To understand this, we must first grasp the physical principle of communicating vessels, where if two or more containers with liquid are connected, regardless of their shape, the liquid will maintain the same levels in all containers. With this in mind, let's take a look at the most important parts of the locks. First, we have the gates. 
These gates operate on hinges but are very heavy. To reduce the strain on the hinges, the gates are hollow. So, when the canal is filled with water, these gates will tend to float, placing much less weight on the hinges. Another detail is that the gates don't close completely flat. They form a V-shape. This provides greater resistance to the gates to contain all the water from the lake. In addition to the obvious communication through the gates, the locks are connected below through another gate, which is responsible for controlling the flow of water. A constant and uniform flow is required to prevent turbulence in the chamber, which could cause the ship to collide with the canal walls. For this purpose, water enters the chamber through dozens of holes located in the floor of the canal. Before a crossing takes place, each lock has a different water level inside. Now, if our little boat can cross the interoceanic canal for this demonstration, we will position ourselves to the north in the Caribbean Sea, which means on the Atlantic side. We enter the canal from Cologne. The first gatun locks open and we can enter. But what would happen if we lost control and collided with the gate? The water would pass turbulently from one lock to another. Our ship would be damaged and the canal will be blocked until the ship is removed and the gate is repaired, resulting in a loss of money. To prevent this, all the gates are double. So if one is damaged, the other set of gates can still contain the water. Let's go back to where we were. We've safely entered the first lock. Now, the internal gate that connects the first and second chambers is open, and following the principle of communicating vessels, some of the water from the second chamber will flow into the first, leaving both chambers at exactly the same water level. When everything is ready, the gates are open, and we can cross. For us, in a small boat, this was easy. But let's take a look at what's happening in the adjacent canal. That approaching vessel is a Panamax ship. Panamax refers to ships with the maximum size allowed to transit the canal, and the margin for error must be minimal. To prevent any contact with the canal walls, locomotives were installed on both sides of the canal. These locomotives hold the ships and keep them on the correct course. The ship moves forward using its own engines, but the locomotives help maintain precise heading. Now, back to our small boat, we are in the second chamber. Next, the lower gate connecting it to the third chamber will open, filling the second chamber slightly and emptying the third. We are now at the same level and can continue. There is something I haven't shown you. Our boat is very small, so filling an entire chamber just for us would be a waste of water and time. That's why there are intermediate gates that can divide a chamber in half. So, the lower gate connecting the lake to the third chamber opens. The lake level drops slightly, although it's imperceptible due to its large size. And chamber 3 is at the same level as the lake. And there we have crossed the first part. Currently, the intermediate gates are rarely used because small vessels usually transit the canal in groups filling the entire available area in the chamber. We continue through Gatun Lake and reach the Culebra Cut. Once we cross it, we arrive at the Pedro Miguel Locks, which we will use to begin our descent to the Pacific Ocean. The gate opens, we enter, the lower gate opens and water is discharged into Lake Miraflores. We pass through and head to the Miraflores locks. We continue our descent using the system we are now familiar with. But at the end of it all, something very important happens. When the last lock must equalize its water level with the ocean, a significant amount of water from the lock is discharged into the sea. Remember that the water in the locks comes from Gatun Lake. And every time the locks at the end open to the sea, water from the lake is lost. The operation of the canal depends on the lake's water level. Remember this. In 1914, the Panama Canal was successfully inaugurated, putting Panama at the center of the world. 
although according to the agreements the canal, the lake and an 8 km strip on each side of the canal would be under US sovereignty, naturally excluding the cities of Colón and Panama. Since the canal depends heavily on the lake's water level, there had to be a plan B. So, in 1935, the Madden Dam was built on the Chagres River, creating another artificial lake as a backup for Gatun Lake. Time passed and Panama desired to regain control of the canal. Negotiations with the United States began in 1970, and in 1977, an agreement was reached, initiating a transition period. On December 31, 1999, the canal came entirely under Panamanian control. All this time, the dimensions of the canal set the standard for building ships. However, as technology advanced, larger ships were constructed that exceeded the Panamax size rendering the canal impassable for them. It was time to accept the unthinkable. The Panama Canal, the greatest engineering feat of its time, had become obsolete. After the necessary studies, the Panama Canal expansion project was developed, commencing in 2007 with three sets of locks on each side. Nevertheless, these new locks would be very different. Beginning with the size, the gates would no longer be swinging but sliding. But the most crucial aspect had to do with water management, as the existing lake couldn't accommodate the volume of water that would be drained. Hence, reutilization basins were constructed. And let's see how they work. The ascent process is easy to grasp, so we'll first explain how the descent process works. Before starting, each of the three locks is filled with water. Each of these locks is connected to three basins each at a different level, and this is what we'll see next. The gate opens, we enter, and then the gate is closed. For the descent process, the first basin is filled, equalizing the level of the lock with that of the first basin. Then the second basin is filled, equalizing the level of the lock with that of the second basin. And finally, the third basin is filled, equalizing the level of the lock with that of the third basin. If we haven't yet equalized the height of the second lock, the excess water that needs to be discharged is poured from the first to the second, similar to the old system. We continue this process until the descent from the lake to the ocean is completed. Once the process is finished, the basins are filled with water, ready for a ship needing to ascend. For the ascending process, the basins empty their contents into the lock. If additional water is required to equalize the level, water from the next lock is used, but in much smaller quantities than before. This is how, in 2016, the expansion and enhancement of this engineering marvel were inaugurated, making it even more exceptional. With the Agua Clara locks on the Atlantic side and the Cocoli locks on the Pacific side, Something that is not directly part of the canal, but equally important, is the bridges that cross it. As their clearances, meaning the height between the water and the bridge, determine the maximum height of vessels that can pass through the canal. On the Pacific side, the oldest bridge is the Bridge of the Americas from 1962, named so for connecting the two halves of America separated by the canal, which has a clearance of 61 meters. Near this bridge is the Centennial Bridge, built in 2004 to commemorate the 100 years of the Republic of Panama, and it has a clearance of 80 meters. Finally, at the Atlantic end, we have the Atlantic Bridge from 2017, built to replace another dating back to 1942, which was dismantled in 2018 to make way for the new bridge, with a clearance of 75 meters. And well, that's everything folks, if you enjoyed it, don't forget to like and share with your friends, and so that you don't lose my future content, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and follow me on my social networks, Facebook and Instagram. This was Andres Cervantes, see you next time.